Hi everybody, it's Professor Michelson again. Uh, this is lecture two in our criminology online class. Um, I'm going to pick up where I left off, uh, reminding you about this concept of uh, criminology, the study of criminology, which is the study of uh, criminal behavior, um, its causes, uh, its definitions, and how we respond to it. Um, I'd like to get a little bit more into the uh, background of where criminology came from. In the late 1700s, um, uh, a philosopher theorist named Beccaria um, in Italy uh, wrote a book uh, called Essays on Crimes and Punishments in Italian. Um, I have it in my office if anybody would like to come take a look at it. And he started out this conversation about crime. His idea about crime was that it was um, a rational choice that people decided to commit criminal behavior because uh, they weighed out the pain and the pleasure um, and made a decision accordingly to either commit crime or not commit crime and that in order to stop criminal behavior we simply had to um, make it so that it wasn't worth it so that people would make decisions um, according to how we as a society chose to help them make those decisions so that if crime wasn't worth it, if crime didn't pay, then people wouldn't do it. So our system of laws had to respond accordingly. We're going to talk about, this is uh, Vecaria in starting criminology is what's called the classical uh, school of criminology. So we're going to be talking about that really soon in a couple of lectures. Um, as criminology moved forward, there were many, many different ways, different perspectives. Uh, we're going to learn about a guy named Lombroso, uh, also considered to be one of the fathers of criminology, who was totally different, took a totally different perspective of criminal behavior. Uh, he suggested that criminal behavior was inborn uh, and that by looking at people's ears and noses and foreheads and tattoos we could tell whether someone was a criminal or not. Um, it's the positivist or biological school of criminology and, and we think it's sort of funny now but you'd be surprised at how um, uh, what do I want to say, sort of persistent those ideas have been and how they've influenced our current thinking about criminology. Um, modern criminology is mainly based in the U.S. Um, and really bloomed starting in the 1920s and the 1940s um, when sociology became a discipline and uh, criminology was considered to be a sub uh, school of criminology, if you will. Um, the you know, people will learn a bit about social disorganization theory, which is uh, sort of was founded at the University of Chicago. Um, people were looking at um, immigration and urbanization and cities, and how crime might have something to do with those patterns. Um, so, uh, modern criminology actually has many, many different perspectives that make it up. There are psychological perspectives on criminal behavior, there are sociological uh, perspectives, biological perspectives. Uh, people who have refined the ideas of Beccaria uh, many, you know, hundreds of years ago are in the neo, uh, neoclassical uh, theorist world. Uh, so we're going to be looking at all of those different theoretical perspectives on criminal behavior. And I'd like you to think about how, um, really, which one rings most true for you. Um, I have my favorites. I have mine that I think work the best. And um, I'd like you to, to sort of maybe find a loyalty if you, uh, if you can. There are other subfields of criminology, like victimology, which looks at the role of victims uh, in the um, whole crime process, from whether or not victims uh, have a role in their own victimization, all the way to um, the victim's role in the criminal justice system, uh, such as victim impact statements. Um, there's applied criminology, and as I said in the last lecture, we're going to be talking towards the end of the semester about the police, the courts, um, corrections, probation, parole, uh, included within corrections, and then the reentry process. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Uh, penology is the study of correction control of known criminal offenders. 
Um, and then lastly, I wanted to make sure you all know criminalistics, um, for those of you who are big fans of uh, CSI and DNA and uh, fingerprints analysis and all that stuff, it's a different field than criminology. Um, we'll be talking about it here and there, but it is something that's different from what we do. Mainly I like to talk about criminalistics um, to the extent that it's involved obviously in the court process and also the role that popular media has had um, on jury decisions. There's something even called the CSI effect where juries are actually looking for technology that doesn't even really exist um, and that uh, some people actually believe that shows like CSI have had a pretty strong effect on juries and jury decisions. Um, Something else that I want to make sure, uh, my lectures are obviously, they're not going to um, cover everything in your book. You've got the book, there's no reason for me to just repeat the stuff from the book, but there are some things I'd like to highlight. Um, so for example, um, I'd like to talk about the difference between deviance and crime. Uh, deviance is an action that departs from the social norms of a particular society. Uh, that's going to differ from society to society. Something that's normal here um, may not be normal at all somewhere else. Um, eating snails is totally normal in France. Not so normal here. I don't know. Maybe you like snails. I don't eat snails. Um, though I'm sure they're delicious to the French people. And I was thinking, um, I went to the beach this summer and uh, there was this guy. And for those of you who saw the movie Bridesmaids, I think about the wedding dress that Maya Rudolph had on. That crazy, fluffy, wacky thing with look like, I don't know, she got attacked by curtains or something. Picture that dress, except many, many, many colors, on a guy with a beard walking along the beach and a hat to match. And that's not all. He also had a dog. It was this little poodle thing. And I like dogs, and this dog wasn't as cute. The dog had, let me see if I can get this right. I think the paws were painted fluorescent orange, and the tail was painted fluorescent green. This guy was just walking along the beach. He was having a blast. I mean, he was just, he was doing great. Everybody was sort of looking at him like, what is that guy doing? What's wrong with that guy? There was a group of like punk kids sitting in front of me with their music, you know, blaring, whatever, and they thought it was hilarious. People were talking about it and looking at him. His behavior was departing from our social norms. People don't usually walk along the beach with a big fluffy multicolored dress on and a dog with orange tail or whatever it was, green tail, whatever it was. What he was doing, however, was not criminal. All deviant behavior is not criminal, and all criminal behavior is not deviant. On the other side of the spectrum, marijuana use is criminal. It's not legal to smoke marijuana. Um, however, it's relatively common in our society, um, and therefore is not necessarily deviant. I've created a discussion board on Blackboard. Let's play a little bit with what you can figure out is deviant but not criminal, or criminal but not deviant. But then there are also things that are both. Um, murdering someone is both deviant, it departs from our social norms, and is also criminal. Um, so there are sort of three categories that, uh, that deviance and criminality can combine or not in many different ways. Now, um, deviant acts become criminal. The, the question of how deviant acts become criminal is a, is a great one. Um, and I'd like to actually get back to that, that um, topic of marijuana. In the 1930s, again, uh, Harry Anslinger, who was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics at the time, he decided to use magazine articles and public appearances and uh, testimony to, to the government to sway public opinion about marijuana, which he believed was truly dangerous. Uh, it was legal up until that time. And he, um, he wanted to make it illegal. So he got up in front of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, trying to pass laws about it, talking about how marijuana made people kill other people um, and go crazy. Um, 
you'll see um, up on, it's a, I think it's on course documents in the PowerPoint for this class, there's a link to the, um, the film uh, that he used at the time uh, called Reefer Madness that showed people going crazy because of marijuana. Um, and as a result of Anslinger's efforts, marijuana was made illegal. People who were, up until then, law-abiding citizens suddenly became criminals uh, because of an act. So it's important to remember that um, criminal behavior is something that is decided on either, well, depending on how you view um, our legal system, either as uh, a consensus or uh, as powerful people making decisions. Uh, and that actually segues nicely into something else that I'd like to focus on. There are really two different models of law. As I said, one is a consensus or otherwise known as a functionalist model, which suggests that as a society we come together to agree on the things that we want to make illegal because they are not in the best interests of our society. Um, it's called a crystallization of the moors. Uh, um, it sort of follows a social contract theory that Locke or Hobbes or Rousseau would talk about. Um, really the idea behind functionalism is that um, social order happens because people come to consensus, a normative consensus, an agreement about what is right and what is wrong for a society, and that we all agree about it, and that laws reflect that social consciousness. That's the consensus model of law. I like to think of it as a Jack McCoy from Law and Order type of thing, you know, uh, believing that it's in the best interest of everyone. The conflict model of law is totally different. It's another way of thinking about it, which says that law comes into being because it is in the best interests of the powerful, um, that people who are in power make laws to stay in power, and people who do not have power are criminalized. Um, the the people uh, like Skolnick, a theorist, Skolnick believes that um, that the laws uh, that sort of from a conflict perspective, laws control the dangerous classes. Um, that wealthy people, powerful people, are not um, are not criminalized, um, and people who have power are not punished the same way that people who do not have powerful. And really, it's about preserving the status quo. It's about keeping powerful in power. Um, the question for the conflict theory of law is, who makes the laws? Why do they make the laws? And whose interests are those laws? Um, who decides what's criminal? Um, and so I'd like you to think about um, whether you believe that we all are uh, agreeing on cons can really making a consensus about our laws or if uh, the laws are just made by powerful people in their own interests. And really, in the end, if you could make the laws, what would you do? Uh, would the laws look like what they look like now or would they look very different from what uh, they do now. Um, and I've, I've put up a discussion board on Blackboard about uh, if you were in charge, um, would you, what would your laws look like? Uh, what would be legal and what would be illegal? Um, would it look like what we have or no? Um, I am talking about law right now, but I want to make it clear, this is not a law class. I am not an attorney. We have some fabulous professors in our department who are attorneys. Um, Professor Connolly, uh, Professor Molay, Professor Judge, uh, and Professor Henry are all attorneys and um, can really talk more about sort of the specifics of the law and if you're interested in that then definitely uh, let's talk about um, introducing you to the paralegal studies minor or um, the paralegal concentration in the justice studies major. Um, that's really all I wanted to highlight for this lecture. Um, our next topic is going to be research methods in criminology. Make sure you're doing the readings um, and under course